should be able to see my first slide now. Uh, I was doubting whether to really focus only on the updates uh, or to, to take uh, along all the general information and I decided to do the latter part. Um, and as I see now that 30% is new, uh, I think I made the right choice. But also because we noticed that even when people use Engage PC for a very long time, um, some principles might have changed or slipped or uh, have evolved into another type of usage, which we not always uh, um, support or be happy with. Um, so what is the HPC UPC? Uh, UBC HPC. Um, so that's a compute facility which was basically started uh, with a, a large kick of grant from the EU to sort of support, professionalize or centralize all the compute um, initiatives that were around. So uh, research groups started to uh, need more compute power. Uh, just bought a big workstation and, and, and sooner than later everybody had a big note uh, somewhere under their desk and it was not properly maintained um, uh, and if you have a bigger project uh, or your project ended um, the, the, the resources didn't match the requirements anymore. So we've set it up uh, for convenient reasons it's just building the UMCU um, but it's a really centralized uh, facility for everybody. Uh, we have two full-time uh, staff, uh, Martin Marinus and René Janssen, uh, which you might have met if you have any contact with uh, the um, uh, HPC people. They, they are still not willing to share their images, uh, their pictures, but uh, hopefully you will have contact with them. Um, um, so at the moment, and this is always changing a little bit, uh, we have about uh, 2400, uh, 2500 CPU cores, uh, a lot of memory, uh, notes slightly differ a bit, all the details can be found on our wiki page, uh, and we have uh, quite a bit of storage. So obviously when you do high performance compute, mostly you need uh, uh, data sets, and, and these tend to be big as well, uh, so we have a high performance data set, um, a data storage, which is directly connected to the compute uh, node, so you can do that efficiently. And also we have some sort of lower performance storage, uh, which is now yeah, mislabeled as archive. Uh, I will come to that, uh, but we prefer to see it as sort of staging software that if you not immediately want to uh, compute on this data, you can sort of park it a little bit there. Um, so we just actually, uh, I don't know if you see my pointer actually, uh, let me... Um, uh, we recently um, sort of switched our operating system uh, from CentOS Saver to Rocky 8. And it, this is now in the final stages of being uh, fully um, sort of penetrated. Um, um, I think this went really without too many uh, big hiccups. Um, so we're now uh, good to go and supported for the next number of years. Uh, and we use Slurm as a cluster manager. So, uh, so Slurm uh, monitors all the resources which are available and when you want to do jobs you talk to Slurm and uh, this manager will sort of position the jobs to a, a node that is free and uh, suitable for your need. Of course we started with this kickoff grant from the UU but uh, the intention was really to be self-sustaining after a number of years. So uh, we, of course we need to replace hardware and support stuff and, and do some innovation uh, on it. So the, the regular users pay by this virtual share uh, model. So you pay a little bit for the resources you use uh, and that money we use directly to uh, replace equipment and uh, keep the HPC and the storage uh, alive. And as you might see on the right, uh, we have quite a big uh, potential user group uh, uh, all over the, the Utrecht campus. So how we organize things, that's basically organized in the PI groups. So we have one PI that, that asks for a number of resources for its group members uh, and, and uh, within that group several users can exist. Uh, and we do that to sort of shield all the data in those groups and also uh, the, the compute resources in that group uh, from other PIs. Um, so uh, many people uh, work with DNA data uh, we also have uh, people working with uh, human data uh, which is still potentially identifiable um, and we can work with that if we close off indeed uh, communication to all this, uh, this other PI groups. But you still have to be very aware of what type of data you use that you don't park it in publicly accessible uh, areas of the storage like temp uh, folders or anything uh, because that we cannot control. 
So a little bit more on this virtual share system. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that we keep it uh, sustainable, but also we want to use it as sort of a, a, a fair use yeah, emergency break, so to say. So uh, if people get really enthusiastic uh, and they are able to fire off uh, 10 million jobs, which take a month uh, and could completely block the HPC, we want to be able to control that a little bit. And we use the shares for this as well. So if you have many shares, you have a little bit more uh, power, you can occupy a, a relatively larger amount of the HPC um, than people with trial usage or uh, only one uh, share. Uh, we do always uh, keep room for the flow of all other projects. So even the biggest groups with many shares cannot fully uh, occupy the HPC. Uh, so we have some ways to, to manipulate this. Uh, uh, of course, if you run into limitations of your account and you get a certain error message that your job cannot run, uh, you can always uh, go to the HPC um, uh, staff or the help desk uh, and say, well, this is an atypical job. Uh, this runs longer than I'm officially allowed. Is it possible to sort of let me through and they will help you uh, anyway? Um, but of course, before you start paying, you can you can have a play with it, see that it meets uh, meet your needs. Uh, if you have a really low amount of compute needs, but it's absolutely not possible somewhere else, uh, we can always host you a little bit on the on the HPC. Okay, so how do you go there? How do you connect to the HPC? And more, there are now multiple ways to do this. Um, so mostly from the the connected institutes and the managed um, uh, workstations. You can directly go to the submit notes and the data transfer notes, uh, work on the Linux command line and, and do your thing basically. Um, we also have some external users and now obviously with the working from home uh, uh, change, uh, we cannot control everybody's uh, working location. Uh, as you can now nicely see from all the people joining from the back garden and stuff. Uh, so then you have to go through the gateway of the Institute, uh, a virtual desktop uh, or anything, or our HPC web interface, which I will show you later. Uh, and obviously this comes with additional uh, security checks, which I will also uh, elaborate a little bit more later. So the storage, uh, so this is, this is an important topic um, uh, because it's essential. Uh, I mentioned we have two types, the high performance, it's just when you're just hammering away on, uh, on data sets and you're computing. Uh, and we have this, this uh, currently named archive storage or, or low performance staging data. So few things we need to stress. Um, uh, there are no backups or data recovery uh, systems in place if you delete data or if data gets lost. Uh, that is really uh, important. It's for compute only and not for long term archiving anyway or, or keeping your data. Um, um, yeah. So obviously it's a professional setup. Uh, so every hardware thing are uh, uh, to protect the data or to, to, to have uh, fault tolerance uh, is enabled. Uh, but if you have an oops moment and you delete your file, uh, there's no way we can get it back. Uh, or if somebody moves it or uh, something happens, um, uh, yeah, there's just simply no way to get it back. It's just too much data to back up and archive and we want the already significant cost to be uh, as low as possible. So it's your responsibility, and I really need to highlight it, that to create backups of the essential data there. Uh, so if you have raw data there, if you have scripts there, or, or really essential um, uh, results, take them away, uh, store them in a proper location, uh, and, and, and really take care and that you manage this properly. Um, then if you look to the archive data, and this is actually currently going on, um, we when we were out of storage on this archive uh, setup, uh, so we were basically forced to invest into a new setup. And we basically decided, uh, do we need to buy new hardware or are we going to piggyback on the UMCU uh, archive solutions? And we chose the latter one. We saw that when we monitored this solution that people actually use it for, for long-term storage uh, as their backup, um, which is not the intention, uh, although I know, uh, understand it's quite cheap storage and, and compare it to the institute's uh, solutions, it's not always ideal. 
but it's it's not the intention of that storage um, so uh, we encourage you to go to the institute look for uh, their solutions um, if it's way too expensive yeah put them under pressure and 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 fight with the regulatory boards that this is needed for research it's data intensive it will only grow uh, and we need to keep it for longer time and, and and make sure they have something in place i will elaborate a little bit on what the umcu is doing uh, in parallel to this and uh, maybe also to help you in the future to to get this uh, cost effective um but already to to warn you with the move uh, and I announced it to the PIs as well, um, so that the price will also change from the, the for the the low performance storage in the in the future, probably from next year. It will be uh, seventy euros per terabyte per year. All right. Um, so as I said, the high performance compute is only is available on every node. Uh, the the staging uh, location is only connected to the transfer nodes. Uh, so that is a uh, um, the reason behind this, so the transfer nodes are really um, 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 equipped with large connections to the network. Uh, so they are really built to have big data transfers going. Uh, and when you move data from the computer or for your location to the, uh, the to the staging software uh, to the staging storage, you can use these connections on the transfer nodes to do it more efficiently. Uh, moreover, we also support uh, additional high performance transport protocols. Uh, so IROTS and Yoda on the UU um, are supported there with the command line instruction kit. Uh, uh, also the UMCU bulk storage uh, is mounted there. So you can uh, also uh, move data from either the HPC high performance, low performance and the, and the bulk, which is the archiving solution uh, from the USU. And you, you can uh, CNOS connect it um, there. Also, um, we have Aspera clients and IA2C, which are really efficient uh, uh, transfer protocols uh, there. Uh, mostly you would now need to install these uh, packages in your own uh, directory, but they, they work really nicely and can make use of this larger uh, connection uh, profile on these transfer nodes. So please do that uh, as much as possible. All right, then. A little bit more on these these archiving solutions because we understand there is a problem we had the problem or um, actually still have the problem that uh, in the umcu there's also not a clear cost efficient uh, uh, way to do this um, so what we now are, are looking at is uh, our bulk storage uh, which is really intended for archiving and you can choose two flavors uh, either non-redundant um, so if you work with backup uh, strategies, you know that it's best to keep two locations of the file, uh, preferably separate into uh, institutes. So that if, if one breaks down by accident, uh, jumbo jet crashes on the server room, uh, you have some, uh, some copy elsewhere. Um, so within the institute, they can al also offer a redundant storage. So it's basically distributed over the science park, two locations separately, uh, Jumbo proof, uh, but then you pay twice the amount because they indeed make a synchronized copy of it. So this is still uh, when we work with data sets that, that grow over 100 terabytes, still an, uh, quite an extensive amount of money if you need to keep it for 10 years, which is the UMCU policy for research data. Uh, projects end budget end uh, and you're stuck with a large bill that actually only grows. So we're looking for external solutions. Uh, we're talking with uh, uh, Surf, which offers different varieties of storage, but also the tape storage, which is really intended for long-term archiving, do not touch the data again, uh, but actually dirt cheap. Um, um, so so um, the price is here, so it's 13 euros per terabyte per year. And if you compare to these numbers, uh, that's a huge difference. This, this number you will never reach with live disks or any, any uh, spinning solution uh, for now. So, uh, but this needs a, a pilot project. Uh, so I see some joined uh, as well. So uh, we're both in that project uh, and we're investigating whether this could be a nice solution for um, um, the UMCU. And, and with my second hat, I also look, uh, could we sort of extend it towards HPC if other institutes do not have uh, or cannot get to this uh, storage. But our experiences are all also shared to other institutes. Hopefully they, uh, they can also connect to this, uh, this sort of uh, set. 
Another project is really uh, more data management driven uh, because when we ask groups uh, to clean up their data or PIs come to, the, to us and say, well, I have 100 terabytes and um, um, I'm moving to uh, Rotterdam or somewhere else. Um, uh, what do we need to do with this data? Um, they even probably don't have a full clue of what's there, what's needed to keep. Uh, so data management software, uh, preferably really machine readable metadata uh, is essential. Um, so we're trying to find uh, solutions to sort of overlay all this storage we have and have some, uh, some better grip on this, uh, this data. This is in progress and one, when stuff comes out, we will uh, inform you as well. All right, um, then I would say something really from the last year, uh, but it's definitely not something from the last year. As you can see from this, uh, this, this sheet, we already started with the GPU since 2017. Um, and, and we have to admit we were a little bit over enthusiastic uh, because hardly anybody used the GPUs at that time. It was just a little bit too early, but with the upcoming of machine learning, deep learning, uh, all the AI projects, uh, and, and you can look through the, the, the ramp up uh, we did in investments, uh, uh, we now have a significant amount of GPUs available, uh, especially uh, thanks to a large uh, collaborative project with uh, the UU and, and UMCU. Uh, where we could invest almost half a million um, in the latest, C la latest GPU uh, nodes, which really allow both massive uh, parallel um, uh, jobs as also significant big model training uh, on these nodes. Um, these are very expensive, I can tell you that, uh, about 50k a piece. Um, um, so we by default divided them into smaller virtual devices uh, to actually mimic uh, all the other, C uh, other GPUs we have. So we split them into chunks that are about 20 gigs uh, a piece. I will, I will show you how you uh, use that a little bit later. Um, and therefore we can now deliver over 100 GPUs for various job sizes. So if you would need these, you basically uh, request a certain GPU type. I made a mistake there. Uh, um, uh, you can ask a GPU type to Slurm. Uh, and, and you can find the information on the wiki as well, how they're named. Uh, also, I included the, the name uh, in here. Um, we have quite a number of these, RTX 6000. Uh, we have a few of the V100s uh, still there. And we have this partial A100. So we can, we can split this big node up into three slots um, and you call them by two uh, G uh, 20 gigabytes. And basically, this is the most important factor. Uh, so two G is just a matter of splitting up. Uh, but the 20 gigabytes is the memory uh, you get from this slot. Um, there's one slight caveat. Uh, depending on the software you use, some tools recognize that this is an A100 card and they think they have 80 gigs of memory, which you don't. Um, so if you have problems and you, you get out of memory uh, things, let us know uh, and, we, and we, we try to help you with that. Uh, but this is to keep actually the share model a little bit alive uh, because otherwise uh, people will jump on the biggest nodes uh, because that's, that's how you want, right? You want all freedom, all, all, all power, give me all power. But this is really expensive. Uh, so at the moment, uh, from this AI for UU project, um, most people do not pay for GPU shares because they're included in the, the first trial uh, of this project. But at some stage, we do need to um, send you a bill for GPU use. Uh, and I can promise you this, this full A100 with all the memory will probably be more expensive than the, the sort of basic category for all these other nodes. So, make a distinction do you really need to have this memory available um, and this is sometimes difficult but at least try low and then if it doesn't work uh, you know you need more uh, that's all fine um, we already i think that was two weeks later when we had these notes we got a question do you have more memory available on these notes well that basically doesn't exist yet um, so keep your models in check if you're developing something that needs regularly 80 gigs on a uh, graphic card, that is a problem. So, um, yeah, uh, of course, we, uh, you can uh, come to us and say, I, I do need this and uh, can we make some arrangements? We will try to help you. But this is, uh, this is hopefully, this will be the exception uh, and not the rule. And by rule, you can use these uh, smaller ones.
but uh, let us know. All right. So when you are at the HPC, you have the terminal. So it's Linux based, you get a command line, uh, you write your scripts, uh, you send them to the cluster manager and your job is, uh, is done and you, you see an overview. Uh, Slurm is not that difficult. Uh, there's quite a lot of documentation on how to talk, uh, how to, uh, to get your uh, overviews um, um, and that's all fine. Um, but mainly the, the use of the HPC is that you create a job and you send it away and you don't see it anymore except for the result that's being finished. Um, sometimes when you're really developing something and uh, you really want to see well or, or troubleshooting something, you really want to have some interaction. You want to see well what is my job actually doing and not always look at log files and, and, and uh, be just too late. You want to see it happening. So you, you can start interactive jobs uh, where you open a slot on the cluster. It's still being scheduled. So sometimes it can take a while depending on the resources you need. But then you get a live terminal on a node and you can just work as it were a workstation like this. Um, what we do not want to advise is that when you come in on Monday, uh, you request an interactive job of a week uh, of uh, 800 cores and uh, 5 terabytes of RAM and have this really nice big workstation available to you for the full week. Uh, we do see it a lot that this uh, high memory virtual slots are requested but not used. Uh, because the administrators can see the, the, the activity there. But they do take up resources for somebody else, which, uh, and therefore they need to wait longer in the queue. Um, and I, I, on the other hand, uh, it still accounts for your um, sort of usage, right? So uh, when this slot is open, um, you will see that you have used so many GPU hours uh, for that time. If you submit a job, when it's in the queue, this is not calculated because it's not running, it's not using resources. It only starts adding to your account when it's actively in use. And when the job is finished, uh, this, this accounting will stop as well. So that's a huge difference between this interactive slot. So use it really if, uh, if you need it. Uh, and, and if you go home, close it uh, and, and try to start one next day. Otherwise, it's really a waste of resources. So next to this, we also do see and appreciate people that do not have lots of Linux experience. Uh, we also see people with graphical tools, which now need significant power. Um, so we, uh, we, we started, I think, one or two years ago, this graphical web interface to the HPC, uh, which is also a way to access it uh, from externally. Um, so you can go uh, to this uh, link. I should have put it on here, uh, actually. It's not, uh, I think. Okay, so please look at the wiki uh, or ask me where the, what the link is uh, to this. Um, so you can use this interface after you've logged in uh, for small data transfers, and really small, like a PDF, a result file, uh, and not, not hundreds of gigabytes of data. Please use the data transfer nodes for this. Um, you also have access to the terminal to have a view on, on uh, your queue maybe, uh, but basically you have uh, this really option to do interactive apps. Uh, you can also start web services, uh, graphical interface, RStudio you can run uh, in a graphical mode. Um, so this is really bridging the gap between uh, the hardcore Linux users um, uh, and, and the sort of starter graphical users. Um, and I think I like that system as well. Um, so how does it work? Uh, once you've logged into this uh, set, you can um, ask for an interactive session. Uh, and then you just provide the resources you want, uh, number of CPUs, either a GPU, yes or no, number of uh, gigabytes of RAM, uh, the duration, do you need it for an hour, do you need it for two days? Uh, uh, then it's going through the queue, uh, it's being scheduled, and once it's being activated, uh, you get a message uh, that this job is ready uh, and you can launch the desktop. And basically you get a graphical interface um, from a Linux workstation. So it's, it's, it's not the same, it's not Windows as well. Uh, um, it's not loaded with software, uh, it's really a basic graphical interface, uh, which you can use. And you can use it basically for everything. So a number of notebooks uh, I've shown here, some, some other uh, graphical uh, IDE environments, um, you name it. You, you do have to install the software uh, yourself, uh, I will elaborate on that as well uh, later, but this is really uh, the graphical overlay. Obviously, this goes through the cluster, and then when, when you're working from home, it goes through the virtual uh, VPN connection as well. So uh, you might experience that if you are really um, that you might have some small delays. 
uh, let us know if this is uh, something uh, unusable. Uh, but sometimes we got this message that this is really something that, that bothers people that when they start typing, uh, it takes five seconds before the text appears. And we can try to help tune or, or look what's wrong uh, in this connection. But uh, usually it should work uh, fine. All right, so a little bit uh, on these uh, surf pilots, um, um, we have a number of them. Um, so when you connect to the HPC, we basically have the administrators connect, provide you with a new account. Uh, so we manage this account, uh, we need to provide a new uh, a login name, a new password, which is uh, it's really annoying, we don't like this uh, management as well. Uh, but it's basically to separate uh, the, the administration of the users from the UMCU because we also have the PMC, the UU and the Hubrecht uh, joining. And there's no centralized system that exchanges all the information uh, yet. It does exist. Uh, actually, SURF, uh, the, the Academic uh, National Institute, has uh, several solutions for this. And we are now exploring ESRAM. Um, so uh, ESRAM is a management system that once we fully connected and have uh, integrated all the systems, uh, we basically can say the HPC uh, is now uh, visible for this and this and this infrastructure uh, institute, I mean, um, and, and all the credentials which exist uh, for every institute, you can now also use to log into the HPC. And this would eradicate all our administration and your, your private HPC account. And uh, we like that uh, as well. What we even like uh, even more that the PIs can have influence on who is accessing accessing their account or their data set uh, so they can add remove block uh, users uh, themselves by just providing with a small tick uh, next to somebody from uh, the collaborating institute or even institute connecting to surf but somewhere else in delft nijmegen groningen uh, so this allows really for collaboration on projects uh, much easier than we need to do uh, right now and hopefully we also get a better grip of who is actually accessing uh, the infrastructure and what data type uh, and when. Together with the, the system uh, I mentioned uh, before, the IROT Yoda, to, to sort of manage the data uh, better, uh, we, we can connect to both uh, systems and really say, well, this is a collaborative data set. This needs to be shared with different users. Uh, uh, but not this data, this is private for the PI or even private for a user and shield this from collaborations. Uh, and that granularity doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, we do try to help when we have these collaborative projects to set up separate, separate accounts, uh, which is also not very convenient, uh, but that's the only way to do it. And hopefully this will be way better managed uh, when, we, uh, when we sort of uh, have these uh, solutions from SURF. And also we will be trying to look at the tape archive. Um, all right, so this is my last slide, uh, maybe the most important slide, uh, actually, but also a nice bridge uh, to Jane's talk, I think. Uh, um, what is actually the HPC offering in terms of software? Um, we can be quite simple about this. We uh, install the Linux and the Slurm uh, modules so that you can, can work with that. Basically, we try to refrain from installing anything else. Uh, because we don't know what version you need, uh, we don't want to keep it uh, up to date, uh, because sometimes the newest update breaks down your pipeline when you really stuck to a specific version. So basically you have all the power there, not all the power, but uh, uh, quite much power you can install and you should install all the software yourself. Uh, so we have a few locations for it. Uh, uh, don't do it in your home directory. Your home folder is really small uh, and usually we see software packages grow quite quickly. Um, so don't do it. Home is mostly for your SSH keys. And uh, well, I don't actually use it at all besides the SSH keys, um, but it's really limited. Uh, you can find on the wiki where you can store it, uh, but main, mainly the group storage on the HPC storage uh, would be the way to go. Um, you can do it if you don't need root permissions. Uh, so we just cannot give you root permissions because it can impact uh, all the other users uh, and, and it's a huge security breach, uh, obviously. Um, so if you have packages that require it, uh, talk to the developer. And I know this is a, this is a do dooner uh, because that usually doesn't exist anymore or it's not responding. But usually they require something which is not compatible with a large shared infrastructure. Uh, and they should be able to change it by making a container out of it or, or um, 
separating components out of it. But uh, this is simply a no-go. Uh, and, and yeah, you can ask the, the, the admins to install it uh, system-wide, but we usually say no, because it's, yeah, it's, it's just not uh, a way to work with the shared environment. Um, we strongly advise to use a package manager, even if you're starting in a small group and say, well, I have control over my versions, I'm the only user, but the groups will grow. Uh, and before you know it, you have 40 people working in the shared RLIPS directory. And I can uh, tell you that is uh, one big nightmare uh, because versions clash, uh, you break down uh, somebody else's pipeline, uh, so you really need to control it. Uh, there are several very good package managers. Uh, Geeks is the one we've had on the HPC. It's still there. It's difficult. It's really well, but uh, I, I, yeah, we actually don't advise it anymore. Most people uh, use Conda, something like that, or Anaconda or Mamba. Uh, that works really nicely. Uh, we support container uh, programming uh, and would actually advise people building pipelines to use containers as much as possible. Uh, it really helps sharing your pipeline. It really helps moving from one compute environment to something else. Uh, it helps uh, documentation a lot and it makes it really stable and reproducible as well. Um, we use Singularity as the, as the runner, uh, not Docker, which you see on, on uh, GitHub and Internet a lot. Uh, Docker requires root permissions, uh, and because of the security reasons, we don't allow that. Um, most of the Docker's can be converted to Singularity. Sometimes they can even be run natively. If you have problems, we can try to convert it uh, with the root account separately. Uh, just ask us, and we, we can do it on a separate machine. Uh, doesn't always work, but uh, most of the time we can make it, uh, make it work. And that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Um, foremost, uh, the admins are always able or not, uh, they're always open uh, for your questions. Uh, you can stop by, you can send a mail to the, the, the HPC admin list. Um, uh, you can also mail me, but preferably the mailing list uh, so that everybody reads it. Uh, for consultation, support, help, um, we are there for the users. Uh, we come with some default suggestions, but if you have a use case or a project that doesn't align with this solution, so we can always try to sort of bend it a little bit so you can at least do your work. Jeff, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, East, first. And I think we are running a little behind schedule, so I will suggest that the, um, Jane will first do the presentation. We'll do the QR at the same time um, in the, by the end of the talk. Is that okay? For you, uh, yeah, I guess, or is it easier if we do questions now for ease, just to keep it separate? I, I think. Agree. Yeah, I think it's okay. Do questions now for ease, if people have. Yeah, do you have any burning questions for ease regarding HPC? Please raise your hands. There's so many participants, but I haven't said yet. Sounds so, like a little clear. Maybe you can give uh, an update on the, the migration to Rocky 8 is. Is that? Uh, yeah, it's done. It's done. OK. So everyone's across. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. All right. That's the update then. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, uh, really nice. <gasps> All right. So, yeah. So uh, we didn't hear anybody really uh, with, with large problems and, and stuff that, that broke down and, and didn't work. Uh, so we do see some uh, uh, people with automations in their script and hard-coded uh, server names or paths that, that uh, fail, but usually it's very easy to correct. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, basically it was quite smooth sailing. Okay, we have yeah. a question. Yes, for Henry. Henry. Yeah, Henry's got a question. Yeah. Yeah, is can you give me a bit about the certification of the the platform? So, to what uh, certificates it's uh, compliant to? Ooh, um, we don't have any accreditation on the system at all. I think that's that's the basic question. So, uh, we are not officially NAN. What is it? Nine two one ten certified. Um, Is that required for someone else's uh, workloads? So a lot of people here in the community that require a particular particular compliancy? We haven't heard any. Uh, and that's obviously the, the main reason that we didn't uh, pursue this, because it's a lot of work to go through. Uh, it was on our agenda. It still is on our agenda, uh, because we, we yeah, it would be nice if we have it uh, right. 
um, but um, yeah, it, it would add a significant uh, administrative workload on it uh, and the separate projects, which which um, yeah do take up valuable time. We are now uh, needing for. Uh, keeping the system alive and if there are no people that say well this is an absolute requirement uh, otherwise I'm going to build my own HPC uh, yeah obviously that's a that's a uh, motivation changer right and as soon as this becomes uh, reality uh, yeah let us know as soon as possible because it, it will take a while yeah there's another question on these um, please unmute to yourself uh, yes, thank you. Uh, sorry for the camera. I cannot turn on right now. So um, I was using on-demand server a lot, uh, but you, so with that's with double factor authentication. But now the old server is uh, not possible to, I think, log in from remotely. So we can only log in to on-demand with the UMC remote laptop. That's good, question. good question and um, oh, yeah. <laughs> this is because of the so every now and then we see the security layers uh, being tightened right so uh, we've had the same thing uh, we, we also for a lot of stuff need to go through the virtual desktop of the umcu uh, yeah. and this um, uh, this is limiting so the the good news is uh, we are working on this and basically uh, when we discuss this eslam um, feature uh, this is supported by SURF when you have the, your institute credentials, which you can use directly on the HPC and not our own administrative system. They can also enforce, enforce a separate and, and universal 2FA uh, solution. Uh, and and uh, when this is in place, we can open it up basically for the world because you, you cannot go, uh, you cannot breach it easily. Uh, but now our security officers say we have one and a half factor authentication we say we have your username password and this key you need to mm -hmm. put in and according to the security officers this is not good enough uh, to open it up for everybody in the world we will get bombarded by uh, by services that will try to break it uh, and if somebody loses their key uh, yeah it, it's, it's just not compatible with the, the rules at the moment so we need SRAM for this uh, and then we'll, we, we can open it up for the world to, to have you work from home much easier but for okay. the moment, you need to go through several hoops, unfortunately. Yes. Okay. Good news, though. Thank you. <laughs> will take a while, huh? I can promise. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And if there's no burning questions, I will just suggest a way proceed to James' the, uh, presentation about the, the workflow managers. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. All right. So hopefully people can see my presentation screen now. Yeah. So um, I think we figured out what the other was. I think uh, we got some good feedback that the questionnaire forced people to answer question three. But anyway, we've got a mix of people who have used workflow managers and people who don't. Um, so I'm going to keep it generic as well because of the different workflow managers that are out there. But basically, a workflow manager is an infrastructure to execute and monitor a set of a pipeline or a set of instructions. Uh, it's particularly in handy for data intensive pipelines so for example we use it to analyze all our whole genome data sets that we use um, so maybe that's also good for me to mention is uh, my experience from workflow managers is from uh, being part of the big data core at the Princess Maxima where we analyze whole genome data or, uh, of the biobank basically uh, and when we've found that workflow managers and pipelines come into handy is when you've got several tasks that you want to perform on a data set, and these actually map to some sort of higher level task. And each individual set in those tasks uses different software packages, and each different package has maybe different runtime parameters. And that maybe in your pipeline, you've got forks or if statements or for loops. And so what I mean by that is that, you know, if you take a very standard um, alignment, uh, um, alignment workflow, you take in fast queues, you align them, and maybe you sort your BAM and then index it, but you've got forks where you do maybe QC and generate some statistics. So that's what I mean by a pipeline. Um, so why you would use a workflow manager is because maybe you're discovering that your bash scripts are becoming more and more complex. Um, and basically what's happening then is you're maybe doing your own plumbing. And workflow manager is a, a layer above this that will stop you from doing your own plumbing and give you infrastructure where you can, um, where it can happen for you. 
And the other thing to keep in mind is that we're not alone. I'm not the only person who wants to align a BAM file. There are many people in the world that want to align BAM files. And that's probably also true for some of the more standard analysis that you're doing. So the idea of using a workflow language would be that you would extend or modify maybe existing pipelines and get a head start. So you're not building everything from scratch. So actually, when I talk about a workflow manager, I'm talking about two separate things. I'm talking about the language that we use to connect the different tasks in your pipeline. And this tends to be a human readable uh, uh, syntax, which depending on whether you're using Snake Make or, or NextFlow, they'll have slightly different styles, but essentially they're human readable. Um, and then they can do very complex data analysis steps and result in actually very powerful workflows. With one command, we can analyze a whole tumor normal, uh, whole genome sample and call variants on it and annotate and do as much as you want. Um, the great thing about the language is that you have very defined inputs and outputs for every task. And depending on the language, you can actually type those inputs and outputs. So you can actually perform essentially integrity checks. And then they make it, this language that we use to program these pipelines makes it easy to transfer information from each task within your pipeline. The executor is the other part of the workflow manager, and that's used then to actually perform the steps, to schedule the, when each step in your workflow is done. And uh, they take care of, for example, the logging. And depending on whether you use a temporary database or a permanent database, this can be then uh, always available. So for example, in our setup, we have a permanent logging of our workflows. So we can always look back and see exactly what was run for, for example, what software was used, what parameters were used. Um, and that makes uh, our audit tra trail complete. Um, the other thing the executor takes care of is making sure there's standard locations for all the intermediate steps which is very handy. For example, if you want to abort or resume a workflow, then you can see exactly where it's got to. Um, and you don't have to go back and do everything from the beginning again, but it can cache temporary results and pick it up and complete it. Um, the API I've written here is also um, used. So we have our standard locations and I talk about resuming things, the way we actually resume our pipelines or start them or check up on them, ask about the metadata is uh, using an API. So we communicate to the workflow manager, for example, through uh, uh, URLs. Um, and the other thing that the executor, for example, a while ago, we shifted from SGE to Slurm. If all your workflows are in a workflow language, it's possible that that uh, it's very simple configuration change and you don't end up have to rewrite all your scripts. So a lot of these workflow engines can actually handle different backgrounds, back, back ends, I should say, backgrounds, back ends. So much so that, uh, for example, you could execute a workflow on the HPC, but then use uh, the workflow executor to say, now I want it to run in the cloud. And then you don't actually have to change your actual uh, workflow. Um, So, uh, let's see, Oops. yeah, there we go. So what do I mean by all these words? I have to have a user disclaimer. I'm actually mainly a Cromwell user, so that's why I've used Whittle here. But you could imagine that this could also be Nextflow, yeah? So somewhere in my pipeline, I've got some complicated uh, set of uh, different types of software that I wanna use. And then I standardize that all into, in this turn, uh, a Whittle or a Nextflow workflow where I say, I've got these tasks. This is my workflow. I want to do A, I want to do B. Um, so once I've defined my workflow, I can send it to the workflow execution engine and its database. And then it will take care of, for example, how to turn those uh, tasks into SBatch commands. Or it'll take care of how to send those instructions through to the cloud. So it's a level of abstraction that sits on top of the HPC. So the advantages of workflow managers is it's really easy, and he's already talked about this, installing your software. It's very easy to run a task within its own environment. For example, using a container. You can use dockers and pull them in through singularity, and then you can isolate, you know, I want this job to run with this version, and these are all the dependency in these. You don't then have to necessarily install stuff. Uh, they handle failures elegantly and can always restart your workflow. And depending on how they're written, and this is a bit of a challenge sometimes, they're essentially portable. 
they're a standardized set of instructions and it should be possible to then pass them on to collaborators. We've talked about them being scalable and they're also quite efficient because they handle the parallelization depending on how you define things. I'm just looking at the time a bit as well. Okay, so there's many different workflow managers. Um, Snake, Make, Nextflow, and Cromwell, I would say, are the most uh, common. And basically, there's an anti-correlation in between how easy they are to learn and what features they are available. And which one best suits you? I will leave a little bit up uh, to your to your own intuition. But Snake, Make is perhaps more uh, suitable if you've got a strong affinity with Python. Uh, Nextflow, I think, has a very large... Uh, community base. So if you want to uh, make use of pipelines that have already been written and extend or modify them, then that's a good place to go. And Cromwell is another a good option with uh, support for lots of different backgrounds. So like I said, the workflow files basically are converting your tasks into an acyclic graph of things that need to be performed. And I said that Widow and Nextflow look a bit the same. This is basically how they look. You know, you have a workflow and they call a task. And then you have to define the task. This is the input, this is the output, and this is what you have to do. Um, so in a nutshell, there's very there's a, a range of things that you can do. For example, you might have a li very linear workflow where you just do step A, it takes this in, it takes this out, and you pass that to step B and so on. Um, but maybe you can have more complicated uh, interactions where you take the input of multiple tasks and pass them on to outside and onto other tasks, and that would be then a branch or merge where you can maybe gather the results of step B and C and put that into D, um, or you can fork out and do things in parallel. And that's why I say it's very powerful is because actually you can get a lot of stuff done really fast if you let it just scatter and do a ginormous for loop. And that then takes care of handling all the jobs uh, and, and submitting them all in parallel to the, the HPC and then tracking how each of them are going. Um, So there's a, a lots and lots of discussion on the internet. I won't dive into the discussion of whether you should use Snake Make or the next flow. Um, yeah, like I said, it's really up to you to take to have a have a think about what best suits your 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 needs. The support for different backgrounds, back ends, I should say, um, different execution engines is about the same on Nextflow and Widow. We do notice that Cromwell is heading and Widow are heading more to support of cloud and less to supporting features on uh, Slurm. Um, the logging is uh, can be persistent with Widow if you use Cromwell. So that's an advantage if you want to have a strong audit trail. Um, they don't have any custom or default functions in uh, Widow Cromwell where they are available in Nextflow. And the readability, I don't know, it's very similar. It's debatable. Um, but I think where Widow differs from Nextflow is the use of having sub workflows um, and, and typing, being able to type your uh, variables. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. So I just had a very quick example of how we use it. So we have a database limp system where we um, store all our parameters. We use Widow and JSON files that we submit to Cromwell, and then they handle the interaction with the HPC. Um, and that works well in our situation. Um, and one of the things that we get back whenever we submit a workflow is this API where we can see exactly, you know, these are the tasks that I need that are happening in my workflow, and this is how they're um, being executed. So this is a timing graph. You can see, for example, that here it stopped working and then Cromwell got restarted, and then it just picked up the workflow and continued on. So that's, uh, I think, one of the most powerful things that we have, at least with the whole genome sequencing data that takes many days to e execute a pipeline, is that we can stop and restart and make use of the caching. Um, however, I talked about the, 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 the challenges of workflows. I think one of the biggest challenges is getting uh, the balance right in between um, an efficient and a generic workflow. So one that will work on the HPC or one that will work on multiple backends. Um, and I think it's good to keep in mind that uh, a workflow language is not a programming language. So every time you write a task is not necessarily every time you would write a function if you were programming in a different language. Um, each task has a certain level of overhead. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are units of granularity that you need to think about. 
um, where we've found, I think where you will find NextFlow very powerful um, is its use of containers. And of course, Cromwell and Widdle can also be used in a container situation. So then you don't need to uh, think about a generic OS, um, but you can actually tailor it for every task. Um, so we make strong use of Docker. Um, and by that, I mean that we have our Widdle and our tasks, and we actually have a container registry of all the tasks that we use. And then, um, so when we submit our workflow, it goes to Cromwell and then Cromwell talks to the HPC by its config and says, okay, this Docker should be used to run this task. And that's how you then uh, can abstract yourself from uh, the underlying operating system and also make a pipeline that will work in the cloud. So whoosh, I'm racing through. Sorry if I'm uh, being confusing, but ask questions in a minute, yeah? Uh, so workflow managers, I would say, use them in, con in combination with containers. That way you can be independent of the operating system. You're free to install whatever you want and you don't have to worry about root restrictions. Um, you can uh, also isolate your software and you don't have to worry about people uh, installing a different R library in a shared location. Um, so they reduce the deployment and in installation times. Um, it's great the caching that you can pick up workflows uh, where they last stopped. This is useful for debugging as well. Um, and I think it's good to think about them in a way that this is a protocol. You know, when, you, when you're in the lab, you have a protocol about how you handle um, uh samples this is basically ends up being a protocol of how you will handle your data set in your study in particular for nextflow there are a lot of standard workflows available so um uh it's always good to check what's already out there because uh it's quite possible that you can uh reuse and modify something um so with that i'd like to thank you for your attention and uh let me know if you have any questions yeah, thank you very much, Jane. So, and uh, you can ask the questions to, to either Jane or Is, and uh, or we will still have two minutes. Of course, the whole session is recorded. You still can reach the two speakers via emails. Uh, okay, uh, so Is where they have a question. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead, Is. I think it's still oh, muted. <laughs> Yeah, nice overview, uh, Jane. So uh, we like uh, Nextflow a lot, as you mentioned. Uh, the the only thing that pops up regularly uh, in our discussion, and I wanted to do now, if you have the same thing with Cromwell. So because it wants to be able to pick up from any point in any time, um, it uses an enormous amount of disk space, uh, and, and sometimes this becomes a, a sort of ridiculous exercise when we start with the sequencing run. And we need to reserve five to six terabytes of external uh, sort of expansion space. Does does Cromwell have the same efficiency? Uh, it, it really depends on how many intermediate files you will have in your workflow. So we are about one one to two terabytes for a whole genome sample. But yeah, it's it's a it's a um, it's a balance, you know, do you accept the loss and start your workflow from the beginning or do you uh, keep previous executions around so you can... Uh, yeah. yeah. No, that, that sounds similar indeed. Uh, yeah. so, so. And it works on MD... That's also... I don't know how it works with NetFlow, but you, you either do it based on MD5s or, or paths. So sometimes it can also take a while to figure out how far it was. If yeah. there's a whole pile of whole genome BAM files, then it needs to MD5 them to figure out whether something's changed and whether it can reuse that result. Yeah. So as a general message, uh, so uh, if you start doing this in, in full production, uh, um, the efficiency comes as a, at, a, at a cost of uh, this storage usually. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Uh, thanks, Is. I, I saw that uh, Hendrik also have a question. Yeah, also, also in the uh, response on uh, uh, Is's question. Um, I also saw workflows in which they uh, remove uh, the in-between steps. So after uh, finishing uh, a particular task, then intermediate results are removed, which of course reduces the data storage uh, footprint. Yeah. yeah, and certainly Cromwell supports that on the cloud. Unfortunately, the backend doesn't uh, support it on the Slurm, but you can do it, of course, yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Any more questions for Jane or Is? 
Okay, I think now is the end of session and uh, thank you very much again and uh, especially for Is and Jane have put spotlights for me because I want to see one more time that's the please join us for our symposium so you can meet the, all the bio uh, informaticians in person next month. So that's the, the last announcement and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us the online today with such a nice summer day and so hope you enjoy the rest of the summertime today probably end up tomorrow and anyway i hope to see everyone and or most of you that's the, on 11th of october see you thank you very much is and jane